So I presume that uh, everyone here is familiar with Krishna consciousness and coming regularly. Is that correct? Any newcomers here? Mm. All right, so question for all of you. Why? Why? Why are you in Krishna consciousness? You may get asked that often, is it? People ask you? Not sure? What do you say? Do you let people know that you're practicing Krishna consciousness? Shaved head and shika? That's a giveaway, is it? That you're something unusual. So what do you say? Why? I will only say like this. If somebody will show me something better... If something will show you better, then... Then I will accept, but so far nobody showed me something better. So far you couldn't find anything better. Mm. What do you say? Radhi, I hope you know. It's very blissful. So Very blissful. Yeah, yeah. Anything else? Yeah? Because they like to be here. Is you like to be here. Yeah. Because of devotee association. Because of devotee association. Yeah. Well, that's <laughs> half, half an answer because it doesn't say why. But, uh, yeah. The, it's blissful. You like to be here. That was the reply I was looking for. Actually, you might say, someone might say, because I like Harinam, I like the philosophy. But what it all comes down to is because we like it. Isn't it? It may be in some cases that people are born in a Vaishnava family and they never really think of anything else. Well, I don't think anyone here is that fortunate. Uh, but we've all come to Krishna consciousness, we've chosen to come and to come again and again and again because we like it, because it's blissful. Um, we experience what Srila Prabhupada called the higher taste. Rasavajan, rasopyasya, parangdrashtva, nivartate. Based on this half verse from Bhagavad Gita that uh, one can starve the senses in an attempt to overcome sensual attraction. But when uh, one gets a higher taste, then one can automatically overcome the lower taste of sense, mundane sensual enjoyment, which understood philosophically is... Philosophically and even practically we can see it's, it's not on a very high level at all, even though the whole world is mad after it. Uh, but it's simply gross. Uh, what the dogs and the cats do, the human beings aspire after also. So it's uh, we have blissful experiences and... Uh, for me also, it's very important when I first came to this movement and still today, that the, the, the philosophical backup. Because if it's just good experiences, then some of might say, well, I, it's blissful, it's ecstasy, but we can buy ecstasy on the street corner <laughs> for five euros or whatever. I don't know. Probably, probably if we go outside in downtown Ljubljana, which is just a few minutes walk away, if you know where to go, there's probably someone selling ecstasy. Probably. 
I mean, we all know Slovenia is very civilized, but it's not so civilized that there's no illicit drug trade, right? So I'm just guessing here. Pill of ecstasy, that's what they come in. Pills, is it? It's so-called ecstasy, which is a, what is it? A, some odd chemically produced drug which has psychotropic effects. And probably for five euros or ten euros or whatever, you can buy ecstasy. But the problem with that is it's artificial ecstasy. And like artificial happiness, any sensual happiness results in distress afterwards. There's a very important teaching of Bhagavad Gita, which is a fact. It's not just someone's idea. In uh, in, a, in uh, at least two verses in Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna says that sensual enjoyment leads to misery. Can anyone think one of them is very, very well known? Can anyone think one of the verses? You're all doing a Bhakti Shastri course here, is it? Anyone? Yehi sang sparsha jab hoga. Anyone can fill in the rest of it? Dukha yonya evate adyanta vanta kauntayana teshu ramate buddha. Ah. Happiness with the apparent happiness, which is or apparent enjoyment, the word bhoga, uh, that comes from the interaction of the senses with the sense objects. Actually, uh, in the beginning, middle, and end, produces only misery. Therefore, an intelligent person doesn't take part in it. In the beginning, uh, even in the contemplation of it. Um, Later on in the Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna, uh, he says, well, actually, there is some ecstasy, some nectar in sense enjoyment. Or at least it seems like that. Vishayendriya samyogam yathadagre mritopamam pariname vishamiva yasukam rajasam sukam describing happiness in the mode of passion. It is that happiness which is generated from the interaction of the senses with the sense objects. Vishayendriya samyogam, which is sangspar shajab hoga, gives the same idea, if you know little Sanskrit. Uh, so, it, it, uh, in the beginning it seems... Yatad agri mritopamam. It's, it's not, it's nectar. It doesn't say exactly nectar. Mrit, amrita upama. It's comparable or it seems like, seems like nectar. If you don't have any experience of the real nectar of Krishna consciousness. Uh, it seems like nectar, but eventually it turns into poison. We're all happiness seeking. The, what is the definition of a living being? It's conscious. And how is that consciousness exercised? The, the consciousness of every living being is exercised in the pursuit of pleasure. Is it not? Everyone seeks pleasure. Every living being, not just human. Even bugs and spiders, and Indra and Brahma and Krishna. Everyone wants to be happy. You see the plants, they'll grow toward the sunlight. So they, they don't have any philosophical understanding of why they do so, but their consciousness being covered, the, the living entity is consciousness being enshrouded in a plant body seeks pleasure by seeking out the sunlight. So every living being is pleasure seeking. And in Krishna consciousness we find that. Other people find it happiness in uh, taking ecstasy pills, in uh, playing computer games, in... there are so many things, so many varieties 
of pursuit of happiness, but you all find it in Krishna consciousness. It is also good to have a philosophical understanding, otherwise we could be misled. We might think, well, if you can buy ecstasy for five euros, then why should I bother with all this getting up early in the morning and following all these principles, like not taking drugs? Why should I bother? But we can understand from Lord Krishna's teachings and uh, we can see practically it's a fact that uh, the so-called happiness of this material world is not ecstasy. <laughs> Otherwise everyone would be ecstatic. But we don't find they're ecstatic. Uh, I still remember to this day, uh, one teacher at school told me something which shocked me at the time. I couldn't. Uh, uh, so he said, yeah, all this talk about sex. But, you know, uh, when you get married, and in those days, well, he was, a, I guess, a moral person. He got married and had sex, not around the other way. Uh, so he said, when you get married and you have sex, you find it's not, it's not so great after all. I thought, oh, that can't be true. Must be. Must be great. Everyone's interested in it. But later on I thought that, well, if sex is really so great, then you see all the people walking around, they all, they're all having sex. Not all the time, but most people regularly. They don't look very happy. Maybe they feel a little bit of happiness at that particular point in time, but most of the time people walk around looking pretty miserable. So, uh, people who are more intelligent, they look for that happiness, which is complete, um, which doesn't end, um, which doesn't cause harm to others. Much of the happiness in this world is at the expense of others. For instance, making jokes at the expense of others. Showing one's superiority by inflicting violence on them, uh, either on an individual or national scale. Uh, eating, killing and eating their bodies. Uh, we hear so much about human rights in the Western world, but uh, no one seems to... Well, there are movements for animal rights also. That means that when you kill the animals, you do so in a humane way. Whatever that means. Uh, someone may be taken to court for murder. Well, I did it in a humane way. I killed him, but... I did it in a way that was instant and there was no excessive pain. Oh, okay. All right. What did it taste like? Very nice. So, uh, so uh, the best happiness is that which lasts forever. But what lasts forever? What's going to last? One, one condition of happiness is it should be never ending. But in this material world, there are all kinds of miseries. This we understand from Bhagavad Gita. Again, we understand from Bhagavad Gita and from practical observation. Uh, one reason, personally, I have a lot of faith in the teachings of Bhagavad Gita is that much of what it says, we can practically observe it. That this material world is full of misery. And even if you try to be happy, you have to suffer birth, death, old age and disease. You may have uh, power, wealth, beauty, uh, intelligence and so many things, but uh, still you have to grow old and die. It is painful. Uh, pain. One may be enjoying this world and all of a sudden experience great pain. I think we've all had that experience, isn't it? That all of a sudden you get some searing pain without any warning, it could be in any, any part of the body. In the tooth, it's very painful. In the back, even in the toes. Even, 
Has anyone ever had a, an ingrowing toenail or fingernail? Yeah? Yeah. Very painful, isn't it? Just that little thing there. How much pleasure can you get out of that, out of the fingernail, that little part? I think nothing. That part. <laughs> but you can get a lot of pain out of it. So, uh, pain is a fact. <coughs> People may talk about different philosophies, this, 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 that, that, is the world real, maybe it's unreal. Well, you can say as much as you like that this world is unreal, but even the greatest proponent of unrealism philosophy, when he gets a toothache, he knows he has it. And he probably goes to the dentist also. He goes to the unreal dentist to have his unreal tooth pulled out so the unreal pain goes away and he has to pay an unreal hundred euros to do it. <laughs> Which he has to work hard in an unreal factory to earn. Uh, and he and, and unreally he feels dismayed that I had to pay so much money. Uh, not a very realistic philosophy. That's something we could agree on. Anyway, uh, spiritual experiences. We are all, you all have... The experience that you have here, it's not just something dancing, singing. Uh, it's just, it, and when I say it's not just dancing and singing, because materialistic people also dance and sing. Uh, in this part of the world, people probably don't, don't dance and sing much unless they've taken alcohol. Is that correct? Yeah. Uh, unless they're professional musicians. Probably don't have too many of them in Slovenia either. Probably. There's a few here and there. Anyway, um, it is a spiritual, it's spiritual experience. We all have spiritual experiences. Isn't that sometimes very uh, graphic experiences, very, very intense? Most of the time, maybe not. Uh, but actually, if we apply ourselves to the process of Krishna consciousness, we uh, we will have spiritual experiences and regularly. It may not be that all the time we're falling on the ground with ashta sattvic bhav, hair standing on end and tears flowing from the eyes like torrents of rain. But uh, the very fact that we daily feel very happy to chant Hare Krishna. Uh, take only Krishna prasadam, hear about Krishna. It's a spiritual experience. Otherwise, we wouldn't go on doing it day after day after day. Often people ask me, how long have you been in this Krishna consciousness? And I tell them so many years, and they say, oh, so many years. Are you happy? And they say, well, why, why would I do it if I'm not happy? If I'm feeling it's a torture, then why should I do it? I, 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 uh, of course, some people say, well, the sannyasis in Iskon, they, they get an opulent lifestyle, and all, all the nice food they like to eat, flying here and there, and it's a, it's a five-star lifestyle. Ah, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're exploiting all you foolish people who... who Give us money so that we can live at the expense of others. Mm. Uh, but uh, all of you, not foolish people, you're not so foolish that you would give money, not that you have billions of dollars to give, uh, billions of euros, or tollens, right? It used to be tollens. They're getting forgotten now. Uh, <coughs> But uh, if a sannyasi in Iskong was a gross materialist uh, and didn't have spiritual practices, then you wouldn't be inspired to give anyway, isn't it? If he's, why should you give? So you give to someone because you think that person will utilize that in Krishna's service and purify your own income. So... Uh, why do we go on year after year chanting Hare Krishna? If we found it boring, why should we year after year follow these principles? Uh, the 
pretty austere for the average person. Of course, there are many vegetarians nowadays, but we're not just vegetarians. We, we don't eat anything unless it's offered to Krishna. And we can't just offer anything. You can't just go and buy some Cadbury's chocolate and offer it to Krishna. Of course, you can do, but it doesn't mean that he's going to accept it. Uh, it should be sattvic foods prepared by devotees. So we follow all these principles, which means sometimes we may have to fast. Because it's not available. So, but why do we follow? Why do we follow all these things? Because there's a spiritual experience. We all have spiritual experience. The happiness of serving Krishna, which we can experience every day. <clears throat> uh, apart from that, we've all had some intense spiritual experiences. I can... I can safely guess or presume that sometimes Krishna gives us some special blast of mercy. Is it? We've all experienced this at some point, presumably. Is it? Yeah. Mostly, in my experience, that comes when we've really been trying hard, taking on some difficulty in Krishna's service. That's in my experience. I don't know about your experiences. But mostly we feel the flow of mercy when we've really taken some austerity in Krishna's service. Some gone beyond the regular call of duty. Uh, uh, put ourselves out and then we feel the, the, the Krishna's mercy flowing in our life. So what I wanted to discuss, again, having spoken all these things, what I wanted to discuss is about uh, discussing spiritual experiences with others. We can have in any oh just like that sudden sharp pain you may you may be just walking along, all of a sudden you feel, oh, such a pain in your back, or pain in your chest. So it may be also that just a devotee is performing his devotional service, maybe chanting, or washing the pots in Krishna's kitchen, or looking after baby, thinking this child is given to me by Krishna, I have to look after this child in Krishna's service, and all of a sudden, some some shaft of mercy comes, of Krishna's mercy, by which one feels some ecstasy. There are some instances of Srila Prabhupada. Of course, we understand that Srila Prabhupada is always... Gopi Bhavar Samritabdila Hari Kalola Magno Mahur. Srila Prabhupada was always diving and surfacing in the ocean of ecstasy, the waves of the ocean of ecstasy, of the uh, Gopi, the feeling of the Gopis for Krishna. But just like the six Goswamis, they didn't, it wasn't that they always showed that. So Srila Prabhupada also didn't always show that, but uh, sometimes he was just overcome by ecstasy. There's one instance that I often think of, that you can hear the recording of this, that uh, Srila Prabhupada he was giving a regular philosophical <coughs> class, as usual, and uh, as often happens in, or sometimes in Srila Prabhupada's lectures, He'll start to speak more quickly and more animatedly. He gets what we would call in ISKCON terminology, borrowed from hippie terminology, fired up. Uh, so Srila Prabhupada is talking about surrender to Krishna, how we should, regular thing that he spoke, how we should surrender to Krishna. Uh, and he said that, and just like the gopis, they never wanted anything from Krishna. He just he was talking about surrender, and then he spoke about well, the gopi, and boom, that was the end of the lecture. Srila Prabhupada just he mentioned the gopis, they never wanted anything from Krishna, and stunned in ecstasy. Another occasion, uh, 
and on one of Srila Prabhupada's lectures finished. Uh, this is in in Mayapur, the Mayapur festival. And Srila Prabhupada was to, talking, I think it must have been maybe 1974 uh, or something. Five. So Srila Prabhupada, maybe it was 70. No, anyway, whatever. So, um, Srila Prabhupada said that you have to utilize your human form of life. You're very fortunate to have this Krishna consciousness. So take it seriously. Practice it seriously. Uh, you have good opportunity to practice Krishna consciousness. You're all young men. I have no such opportunity. I'm an old man. And then Prabhupada in humility just... It's stunned by humility, just stopped speaking. He, he was overcome, thinking of his own misfortune at being an old man and not able to practice Krishna consciousness, which is, of course, his humility. Uh, and we find again and again, but you know, Thakur in his songs, he makes such statements. Namayana Ragna Janamela Mo Bhakti Bhakti. Kati Vinoda Chitte Dukkha Vibha. He says that t taste for the holy name never uh, awakened within my heart, and therefore I'm simply uh, overcome by distress. Uh, although it's very clear from the Bhakti Nautaka's writings that he has a very deep feeling for the holy names, but he, he also feels that he has no feeling. And Bhakti Sansar Thakur also, in his last stage, he, uh, he also listened. He had one of his disciples sing this, and he also felt uh, this mood that, oh, I, I had no taste for the holy name. So, our great Acharyas. They have feelings. We also may have feelings. The difference is that they feel it all the time. And sometimes it, it just bursts out of them. And we cannot, we who are uh, trying to, trying to follow in their footsteps can, can appreciate that, what their exalted position. And for us, sometimes, sometimes Krishna gives us a little taste of that, some extra special mercy. Uh, uh, although generally all the time we should be happy we, we, we must be happy in Krishna consciousness otherwise why are you coming uh, uh, but sometimes there's some special mercy we may also so have dreams of Krishna or his devotees uh, often Indian people ask us have you seen Krishna uh, or they may say I see Krishna in my dreams. I see Krishna. So uh, it's understood. Bhakti is experiential. Pratyakshavagamam dharmyam susukam kartam avi raja vidya raja guhya pavitra medam uttama. This is the best knowledge, the most uh, mystical secret process. Uh, it is the uh, supremely pure, has practically experienced as such, uh, uh, practically experienced in the, uh, un the unending happiness that one ex practically, yeah, experiences. Happiness is to be experienced. We can talk about it, but it's to be experienced. Uh, uh, so generally we experience that and then there may be some special shafts of mercy, bliss, ecstasy that Krishna showers upon us. Uh, many years ago this was, uh, this must have been 1975. Uh, the Chaitanya Charitamrita. Uh, let me see, I think... Uh, about 15 volumes had been printed in two months and three volumes of Bhagavata. So all of a sudden, we had the Chaitanya Charitamrita, which we didn't have. We just had two volumes before that, two or three volumes. And they were more, those two or three volumes were also very philosophical. But the actual pastimes that uh, 
that came out in the later volumes. So we just, it was released, uh, uh, and there was one copy of each volume in Bhaktivedanta Manor, where I, I was residing at the time. So, starting with the temple president and then in order of seniority, it, every devotee got one volume for one day. I wasn't anywhere on the radar. I, was, I wasn't even initiated at the time, as far as I remember. So one of my uh, god-brothers, I, uh, I, I saw him at the end of the day coming out of a room where he'd been hiding. Kishore was his name. I also initiated one of the devotees here. You know him. Kishore from Slovenia. Remembering that Kishore, I gave him that name. So uh, he came out of a room where he'd been hiding away all day with the volume of Chaitanya Charitamrita. I saw he was crying. I said, why are you crying? He said, if you, if you read Chaitanya Charitamrita and you don't cry, then you're not a devotee. <laughs> <laughs> but he didn't say it in a positive, he said it in just, you know, in a voice which, a crying kind of voice. He just could hardly speak. It's so sweet. So, if you want instant ecstasy, Chaitanya Charitamrita Nitta Karo Pan Jaha Hoite Premananda Bhakti Tattagya. Can you understand this? If you read Gita verses, you can, it's very easy to understand. Chaitanya Charitamrita, you understand that? Uh, which Amrita also means nectar, so it's something which, something to be drunk. Anyway. Here, every year, I think you have a very big festival for Balaram Purnima, isn't it? You have lots of honey, and then you drink that, and then you become ecstatic, is it? <laughs> After fasting all day, you become intoxicated. Like Balaram, you're not supposed to become intoxicated. Uh, <clears throat> so, Nitya, we, we, Nitya means eternal, or in this context, daily, regularly, Koro pan, you probably don't know what pan means. Anyone know what pan means? You probably think it's something, this thing that Indian people eat and chew it up. In, in this context, it means drink. Drink, yeah. Uh, so drink regularly the nectar of Chaitanya Charitamrita. Jaha hoita, you won't forget that. That means from which, uh, premananda, that you can understand the bliss of Prem, and Bhakti Tattva Gyan. You also get knowledge about the philosophy of Krishna consciousness. So uh, that's one good program for becoming blissful, especially as here you are all residing in the shelter of the Sri Panchatattva, who are described in Sri Chaitanya Charitamrita. So, everyone should be blissful always. That's Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's program, to be blissful. Um, that is bhakti. That is, is understood. That is bhakti. Bhakti means experience. Yeah. It's, it's an experiential process. It's not... Uh, ultimately, it's experiential. It's not, it's not just... Of course, the philosophy of Krishna consciousness is most important, but ultimately, pibata uh, bhagavata rasam avayam. We should same word pibata drink uh, the, the the bhakti bhagavata ras the ras of Srimad Bhagavatam avayam throughout your life. Go on drinking it. So it's to be ex. Uh, experience and sometimes we may have some very special experiences by the grace of Krishna and uh, naturally we may want to share that with others when one has some good fortune one likes to share that with one's friends because one's friends will also like to hear about that. The devotee likes to hear. If another devotee has become fortunate by having some experience of Krishna, but we should be guarded in doing so. It's uh, 
seem to have a very neophyte devotee or maybe a sahajya type who they like to advertise their spiritual experiences uh, as if boasting uh, I had this experience, that experience uh, how can we know if someone's really on a very high platform bhakti pareshanu bhavo virakti eranyatra cha Srimad Bhagavatam describes that devoted Krishna consciousness means experience of the Supreme Lord, but also it will be seen that one is detached from everything else. So if someone says, Oh, I saw Krishna dancing in Rasalila, I got so inspired, I went and grabbed the next door neighbor's wife and. Uh, no, that's bogus. Uh, there must be detachment from this world. That's why Gorky uh, uh, Das Babaji Maharaj himself has said that uh, Bhakti Siddhanta Sarsar Thakur used to preach this, that you can go to Vrindavan by buying a ticket. You can, from Calcutta, you can take a train to, uh, from Howrah to Mathura. Non-stop train. Non-stop means uh, direct train, not non-stop. It's, well, it's a very slow train, actually. It's called the Tufan Express, but it's a very slow train. Um, so you can get a, uh, you can get a train, you can buy a ticket, but he said, if you're going to, if you think you're going to go to Vrindavan, then don't buy a return ticket. Mm -hmm. If you really think you're going to go to Vrindavan, then go and stay. Don't come back. That's real going to Vrindavan. Otherwise, to say, to, I went there, here's a photo of me in front of Govardhan Hill, here's a photo of me at Banke Bihari, here's a photo of me. At Radha Kun, here's a photo of me, and me, 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 and that's not Vrindavan. He never went to Vrindavan. So, if one has actually experienced uh, Krishna in Vrindavan, then he won't come back. Or, uh, means he won't be, uh, the, the re if one has really experienced Krishna in Vrindavan in, in the fully spiritual sense, then he won't have interest in anything mundane. Rupa Goswami, Smeram Bhangi, what is it, Parichit, I, I don't know the first. He said, Rupa Goswami, in a roundabout way, tells us that don't go to see Govinda at Keshi Ghat. Be very, don't go there, don't go. If you want to retain attraction to your family, friends, house, home, all these things, it's very dangerous. Don't go there. Because if one actually sees the threefold bending form of Govinda, then uh, the, the, if one actually experiences that in the full spiritual sense, then one will not want to come back. He won't come back. Not, not one. Doesn't, doesn't think, well, do I want to or not want to? But he'll be, if one is actually absorbed on that platform of pure devotion, he won't come back. Uh, now, Bhaktisthan Sarasar Thakur himself, he went to Vrindavan, he went back to Calcutta. So what's he speaking of? N no, actually he always lived in Vrindavan. Even before he uh, physically went there, he lived there. And when he went back to Calcutta, he didn't go to Calcutta. He still was in Vrindavan. Whereas someone else may go from Calcutta to Vrindavan, and they never really go to Vrindavan at all. Vrindavan is to be experienced. Of course, even for a materialistic people, materialistic person to go to Vrindavan, they will be benefited. But the real experience of Vrindavan is that of a fully surrendered devotee. So we shouldn't if we have some spiritual experiences, we shouldn't think, oh, now I'm a great devotee, I should tell everyone, I should advertise this, I should let everyone know what a great devotee I am. 
<clears throat> pure devotees, they don't have this consciousness. We see in the songs of Bhakti and Thakur that in many times, and in many in many songs, he condemns himself. Uh, uh, well, there's so many songs in which he. Ama jivan shada pape rata nahika punya ralesh. He says that in my life, uh, my whole life is simply full of sin. There's not even a trace of any piety. For instance, this is one of the many instances. But then in other songs, he also sings about, he, he frankly uh, reveals how he is a gopi in Vrindavan. He gives details of that. Uh, he also says that uh, some of the songs, they're not meant for everyone. Uh, suitably qualified persons they may sing that song uh, <clears throat> he always in his, his uh, in his songs even when he reveals his uh, inner position or his actual position but he always presents himself as a servant maid servant servant of the servant uh, servant, not not directly serving Radha and Krishna, but through uh, other devotees. <clears throat> so this this matter, spiritual experiences, uh, especially well in, a, in both in the neophyte stage and in the more advanced stages. We should be cautious about sharing, about discussing that with others. Um, in the neophyte stage, we may also have some spiritual experience, blast of nectar Krishna gives us to give us a little taste to uh, help us become, uh, to give us a little taste of what great ecstasy is awaiting us when we fully surrender to Krishna. We find in the first canto of Bhagavatam, the Supreme Lord showed himself to Narad, who became uh, very blissful and then vanished again. And vanished and then in an in a, uh, unseen, he, the, the voice came saying that I showed myself to you just to give you some eagerness, to a more eagerness to attain me. Uh, so sometimes even the most perfect devotees, they don't show, they, Krishna doesn't show himself to them to increase their eagerness for him. That's right up to the level of Radharani. Uh, 